If there are stories writers, directors, actors, and artists just love to tell, it's those found in the ancient narratives of the Bible, still relevant today, where since long written down, the stories of our ancestors are interwoven throughout history. One event, though, split history in two, and that's Jesus Christ, separating everything that came before and after. Today on The Perspective with Mike Sherboneau and Julie Stoutland, one of the actors from The Chosen, Jordan Walker Ross, who plays Little James in the film. Mike Sherboneau talks one-on-one -on -one with Jordan, who says his real-life physical disability of scoliosis and cerebral palsy helped him shape his incredible portrayal of one of the Bible's writers whose message was to persevere through trials. Jordan's doing that and so much more. Over to you, Mike and Julie, and this exciting interview. We're glad you're with us today on The Perspective. We've got an exciting program. Uh, Julia had a neat interview with Jordan Walker Ross. And yeah. It just kind of drew me in to uh, watch The Chosen. And uh, 410 million people are watching the story. That's just incredible. I had somebody actually this morning say to me that their boyfriend was watching The Chosen and what he liked about it was that it was very biblical, mm. but the drama is so intense. And there's a bit of a backstory in it, of course, as people are watching it. And likely today you're watching it as well. I encourage you to. Season three is about to begin, I think, November 18th. And uh, so you want to watch what's going to happen. But, you know, Julie, one of the things that's neat about the movie is, or uh, the series, rather, is they're obviously talking about the supreme uh, centrality of who Jesus mm -hmm. is. And as they move towards the crucifixion, we think of the ultimate price, the right. ultimate sacrifice. And uh, I just want to do a shout out again today. We did it at the first of the week, but uh, I just want to do a shout out to all our military folks, mm. uh, those that have served in active or passive roles, those that are serving right now, whose loved ones have paid the uh, supreme price. My dad spent 27 years in the military, and uh, I honor him even though he's passed away. And I honor the memory of his friends who gave their lives. And as we think about the freedom that we have in Canada, let's not take it for granted. Uh, today, on The Perspective, we're also going to be talking about the one who has also paid the supreme price, and that's the Lord Jesus himself. So. Stay with us. we got a great program. In a moment, I'm going to be talking with little James. Jordan, welcome to the program today, and thank you for coming on. Of course. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm uh, excited to be here. Well, i got a million questions for you, but I'm going to try to keep it to four or five today just for the conversation. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about uh, how you got on the, uh, the cast for The Chosen and, and what it's been like. And we'll explore a bit of your back ground later because I know that has really shaped you but I'd just love to hear your your thoughts and how you got there and uh, how exciting has it been for you yeah so you know, I have been pursuing acting since I was six years old when I played Tiny Tim in a little community theater production and uh, I started going out to LA as a teenager on and off for about 10 years and you know would do little things here and there but they're they're just I, I couldn't get anything that stuck uh, and I couldn't find any lasting uh, success or consistent success. And then I moved back to Texas. I started a family. I worked an office job at an acting school, uh, but I felt very unfulfilled creatively. I felt like I wasn't, um, you know, fulfilling my purpose uh, as an actor. And uh, that's when I got the audition for The Chosen. Uh, from my agent and I knew nothing about the the project uh, and I, I went in and originally read for the role of Matthew I I got a call back and then I I did an audition for Andrew um, and then I booked the role of little James so it was uh, exciting you know I hadn't booked anything in several years I uh, was just excited to to be acting again uh, even though I didn't do much in the, those first four episodes. I, I just w loved being on set and working with talented actors and filmmakers. Uh, and then, you know, flash forward to 
four years later and we've wrapped on season three of the chosen and these people are my best friends now they're my family and uh i've got two more kids from you know what i had when i started so it's uh everything has changed yeah yeah but threes are like we're at three now so that's uh that's where where i'm tapping out after three so we're 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 good there well you know i got five and i not that I should have quit at three, but we were just having too much fun, so we just kept going. So <laughs> anyways, you know, I was kind of smiling uh, when you talked about the role of little James. And of course, my mind goes to Robin Hood and his merry men, and there's little John. And uh, although little John wasn't that little, just talk to us about the name itself. You know, it's James the Less uh, or, you know, little James. Who is this person that you're uh, portraying? Well, playing little James on The Chosen is interesting because there's not a lot known about uh, the actual little James or James the Lesser, at least biblically. There, there's some texts and, uh, you know, traditions and, and things throughout history that you can find some context on, on who he was. Uh, he became the first bishop of Jerusalem and, and carried a staff. There, there are little tidbits that you can find here and there, but uh, as far as who he was and what his personality was, there's not a lot known. So th there's been a lot of, uh, you know, freedom to take some liberties and to to make this character our own. Uh, and it, it's been a, a, such a privilege to be a part of shaping who little James is. And one big aspect is Dallas Jenkins, the creator of The Chosen, embracing my own differences and my my disabilities and making it part of the character, which I think has added a whole new level to the character and to the show by one, uh, you know, giving the disabled community representation on screen, but two, it has, uh, you know, allowed, it's created opportunities on, on The Chosen to ask, you know, some tough questions and have difficult conversations and address uh, you know, the relationship between faith and healing, which is a complicated relationship. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of, of uh, that conversation now. I'd like to unpack that with you maybe in the second part of our interview today. But you talked about different things that have shaped you. And uh, many times people see an actor or an actress and they just kind of swoon over them thinking, oh, it's been a cakewalk and all the doors have opened for them. And uh, I think my executive producer is uh, in love with you, but I, I just got to be careful what I say there because this is being recorded. She told me not to get too, uh, you know, bleary eyed or whatever as we were chatting. I said, I'm going to control myself. But we have this vision of movie stars and, and they get escalated to this place of grandeur and people are looking at them. But that wasn't your journey. I mean, you've had a very challenging road to walk through, which... I think is being played out in your character so wonderfully. Take us back to your childhood, if you would, to help us to understand that. Of course. You know, I, I grew up with uh, cerebral palsy and scoliosis. I also have severe asthma. Um, I had over half a dozen major surgeries by the time I was 10 years old uh, at a full spinal fusion. Um, I was in a two week long coma when I was 18 years old. Uh, there was a lot that that I went through medically, um, but I also had, uh, you know, my my grandpa's actor, Barry Corbin. So um, speaking of, you know, people in the industry and having certain ideas or expectations of what their journey has been, that helped me a lot as well. Getting to see the way he interacted with fans and getting to see the struggles he went through as an actor, because, you know, he his very first movie role after pursuing it for 20 years was when he was 40 years old and he played John Travolta's uncle in urban cowboy. So wow. he went 20 years pursuing a career in the film industry without booking anything at all before he booked this big part. And that same year he got stir crazy with uh, Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor and any which way you can with Clint Eastwood and uh, since then, he's done 250 movies and TV shows. So it, you look at his resume and you think, oh, wow, what a great career, which it is. But there were 20 years before that, that he was just scraping to get by. And uh, that offered a lot of, you know, perspective and, and uh, inspiration for me as well, because I remember always telling myself 
you know, as long as you book a movie before you're 40, uh, then, then you're good because that's what my grandpa did. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, so it, you know, it's, it's about, you have to have a, a persistence and, and a bit of delusion, uh, to pursue a career in this industry. Uh, and, uh, I had my mom and, and grandpa there to, to help teach me those, those, uh, qualities. And, and I'm so grateful for that. Well, we want to talk more about that in a minute and also about the whole correlation between faith and healing and your own personal perspective on that. We're talking right now with Jordan Walker Ross, little James of the Chosen. We'll be right back after this short break. You look troubled. I am. You're losing something. I know what that's like. What are you losing? Time. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Someone touched me. If you are really the one who is to come, should we look for someone else? Go and tell John what you hear and see. Who is it? Why did we stop? It's him. I'm Judas of Keriot. I have chosen you twelve as my apostles. Don't feel any different? I don't need you to feel anything to do great things. Well, welcome back to The Perspective. I'm excited today to have uh, one of the stars of The Chosen, uh, Jordan Walker Ross with us. He plays Little James. And as you heard just before the break, we're talking about the whole correlation of the things that shape us and what we have to go through and how that can impact us, especially as we get older. And Jordan, if I could ask you a simple question, when you were young and you're going through the many surgeries that you did, what was the dream that sustained you? What were the things that you were thinking about? You know, I, I found acting when I was uh, six years old. And, and from that moment on, I knew that it's something that I, I wanted to do with my life. I knew that I wanted to be a part of, of making, um, making movies and, and creating art with other people and that camaraderie that, that you feel in, in, you know, making it, uh, that, that was such a special feeling. Um, but I also knew that I, I didn't really feel represented, uh, in film as far as seeing people that walked like I do. And I wanted to be, I, I remember being, a really young kid, like eight or nine years old and telling my mom, uh, when I win an Oscar, I, I want to, uh, tell all of the other kids with disabilities watching or that have a limp, uh, or that have scoliosis or whatever it is, uh, that they can do it too. And, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm at a place where not only I'm able to, to do that, uh, with the platform that chosen has given me, but the, I'm able to do that in the chosen itself by playing a character that has the same disability as I do. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's such an honor to, to be a part of that. So they have actually worked your disability into the script. Yes. Yes. So that, that word disability. Is there a better? Uh, word? So, I mean, it's something that, uh, like it never bothered me, but some people prefer differently abled, uh, which I th think is totally fine. So, but you know, either way, it was something that the creator of the chosen Dallas Jenkins, uh, for our second season, he, because when he wrote season one, he wasn't anticipating someone with cerebral palsy, uh, playing little James. But once I got the part, he decided to incorporate it into the role and it was terrifying at first uh, because it was forcing me to be more vulnerable than I had ever been and to address the thing that I was most insecure about and that I hated about myself, um, you know, because I had lost out on roles because of my limp. I had been cut out of projects because my limp was too noticeable in the past. So uh, it was something I felt I needed to hide and that I should have that I should be ashamed of. Um, and all of the bullying that I experienced because of it. So when Dallas Jenkins embraced it, uh, it, it started me on the journey of embracing it myself and uh, coming to a place of, of not just acceptance, but love, uh, so loving myself and loving the things that make me different. 
And uh, that's one thing that I hope as little James, I can do for other people within the the disabled community is to teach them that just because they're different, it doesn't mean that they're broken. Um, and yeah. So you have a faith in God and obviously it's, it's carried you. How did it shape you when you were younger? So you could process these things and work through uh, the sense of loss of not being able to do what other people could do, but then also being inspired to, to do something unique with yourself. It's interesting because earlier on in life, if even a few years ago, if you would have asked me what I want to be healed, if I could, I would have said yes, without a doubt. Um, and you know, there was a lot of bitterness and anger and comparing myself saying like, why, why did I have to be born like this? You know, even small things like in high school, like, you know, none of the girls like me, they like all the football players and, you know, not the short, you know, guy that's limping around. And it was stuff like that. You're, I just was constantly picking myself apart, um, and, and beating myself up. And I, uh, over time, uh, I realized that the thing that I, I viewed as my greatest weakness and as my greatest flaw, uh, is actually the thing that now I view as one of my greatest strengths and as an asset and something to be proud of. And it's, it's all about perspective and, and we can take the, hand that we've been dealt and be bitter and angry about it, or we can find a way to use it to our advantage and to use it to inspire others and lift others up. And the chosen has allowed me, uh, you know, a, a platform to do just that. And I'm so, so thankful. Can you just talk to me a little bit about the chosen and, and how you participate in the greater vision? What are some of the things they're hoping is going to be accomplished. And there's already been so many things accomplished with what was it the most recent 410 million views and it's just mind boggling. But yeah, what is the vision that you're a part of with them? You know, I, I think the, the thing that I love most about the chosen is how, you know, clearly it's, it's resonated with people on a deep level and not just people of faith, but people of, of all uh, systems of faith or lack thereof. It's something that's reached people on a, a universal scale, which is really unusual for a faith-based project to do. Um, usually it's real, it's, you know, connecting with a very specific group of people, but the chosen, I think the reason it has such a broad reach is because of how, how human all of these characters are and how relatable they are. And the thing that I hope the chosen can has, I know it has done, but can continue to do on an even bigger scale is to to help people feel seen and feel understood uh and to feel represented and to feel loved and to to know that you know in the same way that just because little james is different doesn't mean that he's broken same with matthew matthew is you know on the autism spectrum and you know all of these different characters that you know are quote unquote broken or you know uh, by, uh, by society standards or by the cultures that they live in but uh they can all use those things to their advantage and use those things for good and uh i i hope the chosen can continue to do that and teach people that long after uh all of us are gone well i love it because it's the real deal and uh i just appreciate your transparency and your honesty and even I've given me a little insight because it didn't all happen at once. It's been a growing process as you've learned to open up and embrace your particular situation, which I know is going to be an encouragement to all our viewers today. Jordan, I want to thank you for being with us today on The Perspective. And we're all looking forward to when you get that Oscar. You know we're going to be rooting for you. Well, thank you so much. And I hope everyone checks out the first two episodes of season three of The Chosen in theaters starting on November 18th. 18th is the day it happens. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Thank you. I appreciate it. I want to take this moment to tell you why we do The Perspective. And Julie, there are two words going through my mind. <laughs> I know what they are. What are they? Hope and help. You got it. You knocked it out of the park. <laughs> Hope and help are so important. And can I just share with you as the viewing audience that we want people to experience the hope that happens when they put their trust in Jesus. I know it transformed my life. It will transform yours if it hasn't already. 
We also want to help people and through the many interviews and as we teach God's Word, to help people to realize that the Lord is with us, that He is our refuge and strength. So could I ask you to help me give hope to people across our country? Why not go to the link below and donate to support the perspective and together we can give hope and help to our country. It's so interesting to see how Jordan makes little James come to life and really makes him a, 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 a person that we can relate to today. And I think we, when we look at the Bible and we hear the stories and everything, and we just think, oh, these are nice stories. But I think that's also part of what, what, what Jordan's doing and what the whole Chosen is doing. Is, is It's everyday people. They were living out their everyday lives. And yet these incredible things were happening. And yeah. we need that. It's like a refresher. It, 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 I think that's probably why you're having people that are believers that are maybe uh, or people seekers. About, uh, are seekers or other yeah. people of other faiths are checking it out because it's bringing what happened then into now and how it could have possibly been like in that day as we are living today. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the interesting things is Jordan and I talked about it. I can't remember if it was in the interview or, you know, prior, but the script, it lands on the main points of scripture mm -hmm. and uh, it follows that along. But the backstories are so compelling as they're drawing right. people in and you can begin to think about parts of, of the character and what they might have gone through. And I think the big thing for me out of the interview was how they talked about uh, his own situation. Mm -hmm. And Jordan talked about the healing power of Christ and they actually worked it into the, the script and asked the question, well, how come Jesus hasn't healed you yet? Mm. And out of his own journey, he shares that that hadn't phased him either. Right, right. I, it's so as I think about that, uh, I just want to encourage people, uh, if you're looking for some really good entertainment, this is a great thing to watch. And again, in a couple moments, I'm going to be back to teach the final segment out of the book of Joshua, they could write a story on that. What a, an action-packed place that is as we talk about decision-making, defining moments in our life. Well, as we come to the final part in this story out of Joshua chapter 3, there's a statement that we need to repeat again, and it's this. When you make a decision, that decision will turn around and make you. And now Joshua is facing the first major decision of his leadership. It's a crisis point, and he is having to make a choice, can I trust God? And so they're coming to the Jordan River that is just raging. In the back of his mind, he's thinking, Moses led the people through the Red Sea. God has said, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And now Joshua has to decide in his heart, is it really true? Is God's promise going to be true for me? And there's a key phrase that comes in this passage in chapter 3. It says, go stand in the river. Uh, go stand uh, and take your place. Because there will be times that we'll be called to step into the river. And we need to pray that we'll be faithful as we lead others in this journey. Say, well, who am I leading? Well, it could be your family. It could be your spouse. It could be your good friend. Who you're influencing, you have to go and stand in the river. And for me, it's all those and, a, and more. As I think about the church that I lead, as I think about this ministry, what does it mean to stand in the river? Well, they went and they stood in the river. And who was it? It was the leaders. The leaders had to go and stand. Let me read to you from chapter 3. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and the Ark was a symbol, it was a box that held the Ten Commandments and some of the manna, the food that God gave them each day. So it kept those things inside. And it says, as soon as you see the Ark, the, mem the, the visual reminder of the covenant of the Lord, your God being carried by the priests, then you'll set out from your place and follow it. But keep a distance between you, about 2,000 cubits in length. Don't come near it in order that you may know the way that you should go. So here it's very interesting. God is saying, as you trust me, as you go stand in the river, 
keep distance so you can see, and then you're going to know the way you're going to go. So how do you process your defining moment? There are a couple things here in the passage that I want to give to you. I've been waiting all week to get to this part, and I, I hope that you'll just kind of drink it in because I know that I am again. And the first thing is this. Before you do anything major, you need to take a holy time out. Say, what are you talking about? Well, in verse 5, Joshua had said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. Take a holy time out. You need to take time where you can just climatize and listen for God's voice. I think of some of the interviews I've had this past week that Julie and I have had and how some of the people we've been talking with are just saying, you got to step back and listen for God's voice. And you know, this holy time out was important. They knew, Joshua knew, this was a time for resetting the troops. And how you handle your Jordan River, I'm going to tell you this, you need to first be right with God. That's why he says, consecrate yourself. And then secondly, you need to listen for what God is saying. In verses 3 and 4 that we read, it says, as you see the ark being carried out, keep a distance, and then you will know which way to go. The ark was to be ahead of them. It was a military move, but also a religious processional move. Think of a friend of ours who uh, always had a passion to open a home for battered kids. And I knew that God was speaking to them, but they didn't respond. And at the moment when God said, go stand in the river, they didn't. They stood at the bank. Don't let that story be told of you. Don't miss the opportunities that God has given to you today. You might not have it all figured out. Well, don't worry. It wouldn't be faith if you had it figured out. And speaking of faith, in verse 8, they have to take a step of faith. So take a holy time out. Listen for what God is saying and take a step of faith in verse 8. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant that when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Now think about these guys as they're walking in. They got the Ark. It's on two long poles. And uh, there's a number of them at the front and at the back carrying the Ark in. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd want to be the guy at the back. Because the guy at the front gets in, he dips his toes, then he's up to his ankles, then his calves, and then his knees, and maybe up to his chest. And he's wondering, when is it going to happen? But as soon as they all get in, the water parts. And there is dry ground. Interesting they say dry ground because that's exactly what happened to Moses. Do you remember God's promise to Joshua? As I was with Moses, I will be with you. But I get excited when I think about, in my mind, the visual reenactment of what it must have looked like. Because as the families were walking through, you think of the priests who had walked in first, wondering, can God be trusted? And some little kid says, that's my dad over there. That's my dad. He went in first, or he went in second. They stood in the river, and they saw it part. Today, you're making a decision. You're facing your Jordan River. Step out in faith and know that you can trust God, that he will part the waters. And I am praying today that his presence will be so real, so tangible, that you will sense his hand on you saying, this is the way you need to go. 